that, here's Michael Thompson. <sighs> All right. <laughs> All right. Um, just so I kind of get a feeling, how many people out there are currently doing no-till? Raise your hand. Okay. How many people are experimenting or doing cover crops? Uh, any grazing on those on farmland acres or cover crops? Okay. Okay. Well, that's good. I, I'm not going to be teaching anything probably too new, but I, I will be reiterating some of the, the concepts mm -hmm. behind there because I really, I really feel like, you know, it's now or never. It's the time that we've got to make a movement to try to, you know, change our soil, to, to improve our soil. Um, you know, I guess I'm going to start out with, with just this slide. Uh, an hourglass, you know, we don't think about it, but it's every second, you know, those it's dropping sand through there. That's a second of our day. That's our day going by, you know. Um, seconds become hours, become days. So we think that we'll always have tomorrow or the next day or the next day, but we really need to be living in the moment and doing all that we can do now to protect our soil and to make our soil better. Uh, this is actually one of my classmates. Uh, unfortunately, she didn't have much, uh, much time with us on this earth, uh, but she did make a huge impact on a lot of people in our community, a lot of people in our church. Um, you know, and people haven't forgot about her to this day. So each one of you has the power to do what you can do on your farmland to make an impact, not only for your farm, but for your neighbors and for your community. So, you know, we're all in this together. We're only given so many days and so many years on this earth. So we need to do as much as we possibly can. You know, um, speaking on that concept of time, if you look at this, you know, a few years back, uh, there was a report that came out that they said there was only 60 years of farming left on this planet. And uh, I thought that was just ludicrous that, you know, we're doing no-till, we're doing cover crops, we're doing a lot of good things for the soil. But then you start looking around at, at, at farmland, you know, and how many more years can we farm like this with this kind of erosion loss, you know? Um, you know, in my area, you don't see it as much maybe in your area, but we have huge blowing events when we dry out the topsoil blows away and we have huge events where a lot of our fertility is lost to the wind. So basically, you know, we, we got to think about all these events that, you know, it doesn't seem like it's much, but with our, our fertilizer prices today, you can think that every time that this topsoil or your good productive ground where you put that fertilizer on leaves, that's, that's basically money that's leaving your pocket. You know, we never really think about the huge impact erosion has on it, but erosion has a huge impact on our bottom line. Um, there's been a lot of studies that over half of the fertility that we put on currently is just to make up for the, the lack of, uh, the lack of, uh, for the lack of, uh, fertility that we lose with erosion. But you look at all this erosion, like, uh, this is the huge thing that's happening in my area right now with, with grain prices being like they are. We're having huge amounts of tracts of, uh, probably marginal pasture land that's taken out and put into production. Uh, this has been going for about seven years now, and look what it looks like. You can tell that we don't have too many more years. And like I said, about half of the fertilizer that we put on the ground usually is to make up for this loss that we have from, you know, from the erosion. Uh, soil, the thickness of a dime is five tons of soil loss. So you think about there when you've got literally a foot and a half of soil in the ditch that this was actually broken out of sod too. So this was thousands of years of natural fertility that's lost in one wind event. So you know, and we really have to be truly talking about when we're out there, get out of your tractor cab. I know it's easy to get busy and, and to do that and to not get out on your ground, but when you're walking to your tractor, when you're out checking how deep the seed is in the ground, actually think about what you're feeling underneath your feet. You know, which are you farming? Are you farming a brick or a sponge? You know, our old tillage methods, a lot of them were like the brick. We, you know, farmed, we oxidized a lot of our organic matter out of our soils. We burnt the organic matter out of our soils and we made them real tight and they set up in the sun like a brick. You know, we want it to be more like that sponge and what we're trying to do with no-till, uh, with uh, putting a cover or some kind of soil improvement crop in between our cash crops, uh, trying to get that porosity up so we can catch as much water as we can. Because even down here, I know that there's times where you go through and you get dry. So we need to try to make as much in that profile instead of that top foot, we need it in the top four or five feet. So. You know, um, this is basically where we're at in case anybody's interested. Uh, we are four counties over in the top tier of counties. I've, I'm actually about a mile and a half from the, or almost two miles from the state line is where I live. And so actually I don't farm anything in Kansas. I'm a Nebraska farmer. So, but anyway, um, 
we are very rolling. I'm very jealous of some of the topography you have down here because we have a lot of hills. So that's basically how we got into no-till, that if we didn't start going to no-till and we didn't start having more cover, we were losing so much that we basically weren't profitable because our ground was washing and blowing away on us. So, you know, growing up, we did everything. I, I was hardcore into the tillage as far as, you know, I didn't grow up no-till. Uh, at eight years of age, my dad set me in the tractor just like that one, a 4386 International, and my job was to work the ground. Every time we saw a weed on the fallow, I'd go out and work it. Anytime, um, as dad and mom were running combines harvesting, my job was to be in the tractor and I was disking stubble before it set up like a brick. So we never thought about why it set up like a brick, it just always did. And same thing, our cattle operation was never integrated into our farming operation, they're two separate entities. So we'd kick the cattle out. This isn't actually my picture because it's green and it was never green by the time we got grass down this, this bear. But in August, I, Growing up, I hated cattle because they'd always be out running all over the place, um, breaking down fences, being out in our crops or neighbor's crops, and we'd spend day after day fixing fence and getting cattle back in, and it was just because they didn't have anything left to eat. So, um, you know, I, I didn't think about it growing up, but then at 18, I was basically sat down and told, the way we're farming, you're not going to be coming back to the farm, that dad's the last farmer, you know, my mom sat me down and said, there's no way that you could possibly farm because there's, there's no place for you. We're not profitable enough. So went off and got my teaching degree and I didn't listen too well because I came back to farm. But when I came back to farm, when I bought my first ground, I knew that the conventional tillage was not how we were gonna fix the problem or how I was gonna have a place to farm. So I started reading a lot about, you know, how our native prairies were formed. And that was just basically through, uh, you know, through a ruminant animal uh, and a growing crop as much of the year as possible, and that happened to be prairie or grass. So what we need to do is we need to go ahead and we need to think about when we're developing these cover crops, don't get all, you know, so many people want the ease of, well, I've got straight cereal rye, or I've got straight wheat, or I've got straight sorghums, you know. But you need really need to think about that native prairie had different architecture to all those root systems. They were going down into different parts of the profile. And some of that was because some of those deeper rooted plants are actually pulling moisture up to the shallower rooted plants. And some of those shallower wood rooted plants are actually taking out the surface compaction layers so that more water can infiltrate into deeper in the profile. So it's kind of a, nature had it figured out how to marry these things together. And we need to try to mimic that as much as possible in our cropping rotations to keep surface compaction down, especially if we have grazing on that of that acreage or we have the, the big loads at harvest time on those acreages. We need to mimic what the prairie was doing with, with these different rooting profiles. Um, on our farm, I don't know why, dad always had a saying, nothing ventured, nothing gained. He'd always try a little bit of crazy stuff. Uh, we started corn as early as 1985, which nobody up on the hill, we have an irrigated valley where everybody raised corn, but we were the first ones up on the hill to start growing corn in 85. And so he's always trying something new. but. The hardest part about making no-till and cover crops and this way of farming to work is basically we have to have a brain transplant. We've got to basically throw away everything that we've learned that was the way it worked in conventional agriculture. Um, we just really need to get rid of that whole um, ideas that we had because a lot of those ideas don't work in this kind of system. So we've got to work at getting that brain transplant and throwing out all those previous knowledge and, and just starting anew and trying to get educated to, to look at our soils in a different way. Um, back when we farmed conventionally, we didn't think of the soil as anything more than something we laid the seed in. We didn't think about whether it was cycling nutrients. We didn't think about was there biology? Was it um, how much moisture was going into the soil? We just never thought about those things. Uh, I think if you really want to start down that path, you need to look at your soil as being the most important thing on your farm. You know, we think about tractors and technology and GPS and all these things on our farms as generating revenue. Well, really, we can't generate revenue without our soil being the right way it needs to be to grow the healthy crops, to grow the healthy grass, to grow the cover crops. You know, we need to look at the, at the soil as being the most important thing because that's where all your profit starts with your soil. Um, the hardest part about this mindset change is the moisture thing. I know that probably, maybe you haven't had it drilled in your mind quite as much as we did, but in a wheat fallow system, it was any growing plant was using moisture. Anything that was out there that was green was using moisture. 
well, you've got to kind of move away from that. You're, you're investing in the future when you're planting these plants or when you're growing these cover crops or you're tidying, tightening your crop rotations. Um, it requires moisture to grow the covers, to grow the, the crops, and to grow the residue, but we can't conserve or regulate that moisture without that cover and without that cover crop growing period. Um, if you look in Kansas, and I know you're in a higher rainfall area than what I'm at, I'm about a 22 inch rainfall, but um, there's more days in Kansas that we can evaporate it out and we can lose moisture than we gain the moisture. Um, we don't have a lot of those days where it sets and we get two weeks of nice rainy moisture where we get a really good uh, soaking rain like they do in other places. So we've got to prepare a place for that moisture and get it into that soil soil and, and to harvest that moisture and keep it in the soil and not lose it, take the evaporation out of that equation. Um, Again, probably the new water paradigm, that's a paper that's a P free PDF that talks about the water cycle. And if you're really interested in learning more about how covers and how water work, uh, it's a really good read. It's about 85 pages, but it's a really good read that talks about um, you know, using cover crops, using how to heal your water cycle locally and keep the water here. So basically that's what we need. Yes? Say that paper again. It's right down there. The new water paradigm, water recovery for the climate. Um, it's actually, it's actually, it's, I believe it came from, it's European. I believe that it was, I don't know if it's Belarus. It was somewhere over there. But um, basically in that paper, it talks about healing your small water cycle. And the small water cycle is the water cycle right here. So if we have wa plants transpiring water out of the ground, we want them to put the water vapor up into the air and then have that green surface growing so that we actually have it rain on this ground. Because if you have a lot of bare soil, it reflects a lot of heat up. And I am very convinced that we're losing a lot of our moisture here in Western Kansas and in Kansas and Oklahoma and all of our area. And they're getting it over in corn country because they have that green canopy during the summer and they're harvesting a lot of the moisture we evaporate. So we wanna keep them happy by not giving them our moisture and we wanna keep our moisture. So we need to be a little more stingy with our moisture. In my area, it's a well-known fact that cover crops use too much moisture. Everybody says that. But it's not about using the moisture, it's about planting with a purpose, opening the soil up and getting that moisture in the ground. Because you can see two sides of the fence. Basically one was just the one on your left um, and the one on the right had the cover crops, the one on the left basically had wheat stubble. The wheat stubble was hard and compacted, not much moisture infiltrated the ground. Um, on the side with the cover crops, we used some rapeseed and some daikon radish along with some sunflower with a warm season mix that was planted into the wheat stubble. That not only gave us uh, some more soil cover, but it also, uh, the, the results were basically we got more moisture. When we did get very limited rainfall, we got more moisture in the profile. So you can see, if nothing more, that the, the cover crop really gave us a lot more cover between the rows because there's the, what's disintegrating down. And as that disintegrates down, that's actually feeding that plant towards the tail end. It's kind of a, a feeding source. The, the microbiology is breaking that down. It's feeding and it's, it's making for a bigger and, and better grain crop. So, um, you know, if we can harvest that extra inch or two of moisture and put in the profile, it's a lot of difference. That was basically an insurance check on the other side. And I think it's like 105, 110 bushel corn on the other side, which might not sound like much, but in a drought, that was pretty awesome. Um, anybody else out there cheap? I am very cheap. I don't want to invest anything more than I have to. So we got to use our free elements to generate revenue on our farms. Uh, number one, the biggest one we take for granted is the sun. You, nobody thinks about the sun as being, you know, it comes up, it goes down. But it's a huge, huge potential for capturing that energy from the sun and converting it into something we can generate revenue off of on our farms and ranches. Uh, we need to capture as much rainfall and snowfall as we get. Again, that's about getting it into the profile instead of letting it blow off in the ditch or watching it go into the ditch or the farm pond, getting it in the profile. Uh, we need to capture our carbon from the air, which right now with our current administration, they're putting a huge uh, push for, from the environmental impact of carbon dioxide and carbon in the air. And we have a huge potential for sequestering a lot in our farmland and it's actually gonna help you out and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, stimulating biology and the earthworms, that's your free underground help, that that's where the nutrition comes at. When you start hearing people say that they're getting a bushel and a half off a pound of nitrogen or two bushels off a pound of nitrogen, 
that's where it's coming from. That microbiology is making their fertilizer more efficient because it's giving it the extra boost. You're getting more fertility from natural fertility from your soil. Um, so like I said, nobody thinks about the sun as being a power source, but I thought this was kind of a cool fact that I found that if an ice bridge from the earth to the sun existed that was two miles wide and one mile thick, it could be melted in one second. So basically there's a huge amount of power that the sunlight that falls on a square meter could power your computer for a day. So there's a lot of energy in there. And if you've got bare soil like that, there's nowhere for that, soil, that sun to be harnessed. Um, the only way you can harness it is through a green growing plant, whether it be a cash crop or a cover crop that's improving the soil. When the soil's bare like that, the sun's doing more harm than good. It's drying your soil out. We all know in the middle of summer it gets hot and it cooks the soil and makes it hard like a brick and we don't want that. And biology, your soil life isn't gonna be happy in a hard cooked soil. So we need to keep that soil covered and we need to keep as much living biology as we possibly can, a living plant on there. Um, and I'll talk about that in a minute. This is basically what our, you know, what a cover crop would look like. Again, a lot of biomass, you see very little, you know, places where there isn't a green growing leaf to harvest that sunlight. So that's basically what we're kicking cows out. We're turning it into revenue. It, it's a very cheap mix, so you could easily call this a fallow replacement. You know, if you plant it into wheat stubble, it would save you just the cost of your spraying trips. But we uh, get the extra grazing out of it is how we turn it into some cash. You know, how effective is your rainfall? Uh, this is pretty prevalent wheat fallow system in our area, but I think that you probably can see that in your areas, even anywhere that's terraced or has low spots. If you've got water ponding in the low spots, chances are it came from a spot that wasn't harvesting the water and getting it into the profile. So, you know, it's more about the inches stored in the soil than the receive. You can get an inch of rain and only store 10 hundredths of it, or you can get an inch of rain and you can store 100% of that inch of rain down in the profile, in the one, two, and three foot profile. So, um, again, same way with snowfall, we gotta think about, you know, be very cognizant of when we're removing residue how much residue we remove. We've got to keep some residue out there for, you know, for the future. And, you know, when we get the snows, we all, we're in Kansas and it probably comes with a wind. So we need as much residue to try, kind of keep that laying where it can. We are using water to improve soil. Um, there's no two doubts about it. But again, every time we start using that moisture, and this was a very severe event where we just didn't get any moisture all spring. But then when we did get that one rain, we opened the soil up that we basically recovered that moisture. So it's basically an investment in the future productivity and to hold that moisture within the profile. Uh, the biggest thing is, is if I would have had nothing growing there and then we would have had that rain, you could just take that bar and move it up to like 160, 180% of water holding capacity of the soil if we wouldn't have used any of this moisture. Where we use this moisture, the water profile held it, or the soil profile hold, held that extra water. If we wouldn't have held that water, it would have been runoff, it would have been ditching, it would have been probably blowing terraces out, it would have been problems. So we're using water, but we're making, making uh, room for more water, but we're turning it into a saleable product. For me, it's pounds of beef. For you, it might be a double crop. Uh, you just gotta figure out what works for your scenario. Again, retain residue. The more you can get residue on that soil, and I wish after the winds that we've had in the last couple, you know, the last couple months, that everything was perfectly covered. The stuff we've grazed is the best. Um, on some of our corn stalks, we're gonna have to have some, some, grow some more residue on there because we've lost some residue with the winds. But the best part is, is that if you do incorporate the grazing, you can uh, subdivide it. You can keep them out there for just, you know, 12 hours, uh, 24 hours and you can keep a lot more residue on your soil that way. So, and also you cycle a lot more nutrients. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, that residue regulates soil temperature. You never think about how much that plays into it. But when we've got a horrible amount of, you know, bare soil, it can easily get 130 degrees on that surface. If it's bare soil and it's out in the middle of summer, um, but the, you, you're losing, 100% of that surface moisture. That's why you get that dry on the top. Uh, at 100 degrees, 15% of moisture is used, or 15% of moisture is used for the plant growth. So basically, the lower you can get that, you can't make it rain more, but you can effectively make it through droughts longer because you're keeping the soil cooler and that water's not lost to evaporation. So um, again, we're limiting evaporation. We're keep, a limiting evaporation. This is actually temperature probe on that moisture probe. And you can see even on the hotter days in July and stuff, 
we're between 10 and 15 degrees cooler than what the actual outside temperatures are. We're between 80 and 85 degrees all the way across there. So, um, you know, if you can keep it between 80 and 85 degrees, you're going to lose a lot less to actual um, evaporation. So, you know, this is what a carbon rich, healthy soil looks like. Uh, this is Springfield, Colorado, which is right west of Liberal. So it's pretty de desperate and dire country out there these days. But this was when they first broke it. They took it out of sod. And you can see they can raise really, really good crops. And that's what it looks like today. So when we are extractive, there's no doubt about it. We can do anything with our soils. We can put fertilizer on. We can take, we can take, we can take. And it is a model that works for our generation. But, you know, two, three generations down the road, this is what you get. You know, what's your grandchildren? What's your great-grandchildren? You know, what's society in general going to live off of if we keep mining our soil of all of our carbon? And we're also, it's something that basically our government leaders, our, you know, a lot of people in town, they want the carbon out of their atmosphere anyway, and we can sequester it. So I think that's why we need to continue to look at these kinds of farming methods. It's only going to be more backed by programs. It's only going to become more important in the next 15, 20 years that we keep that. Uh, this is the difference that carbon makes on our own farm. Um, you can see, you can actually see the darker, um, you know, same time frame, same amount, and that darker thing is carbon, but it's also moisture holding because for every, basically, for every one part carbon, you hold uh, seven parts moisture. So every little bit of carbon you get in, the more you can hold moisture. So in your environment, it'll actually benefit you too. And the fact that the more carbon you have in the soils, the more moisture you can hold, the earlier you can get back in the fields when you get those bigger rain events. Uh, again, this is about a 2.5, 2.8% organic matter field. It's considered one of our better fields that dad didn't push the cover crops on near as much. And you can see there's only about 12 inches of that good carbon layer on the top, 36 inches uh, where we've actually ran the cover crops and grazing. So we are putting that cover crop, or we're putting that carbon back in the soil. And for people that don't understand the mechanics behind that, all we're doing is basically, this is a, a new to us soil. You can tell you it's pretty blocky and pretty hard from years of tillage, but you can already see we're putting that carbon back down. And what that is, is wherever those roots go, those roots are actually put in sugars. Uh, through the photosynthesis process, the roots actually leak sugars or put sugars into the soil. Uh, that's to feed microbial life. The microbial populations start increasing and they in turn feed the plant. So basically what you're doing is you're starting to cycle, cycle carbon out, of, put carbon into the soil and that carbon is also the lifeblood for all your micronutrients. And those micronutrients are important because with fertilizer prices being like they are, if you can get an extra 40, 60, 80 pounds of in out of these equivalent out of this soil life, it's going to be money in the bank for you. You know, that's how you're going to withstand, you know, the, the current economic times. Um, a soil rich in carbon is basically the home for all of these things, the roots, the microbes, the fungi. Um, they are your free underground help. Like I said, they don't cost a dime. All they cost is the management. You've got to keep good soil cover and you've got to try to keep them fed. You've got to try to keep a growing root as much of the year as possible. I know that we go through dry times and there's times where it's just hard to get anything planted, but if you can get something planted, it'll benefit you in the long run. Um, that soil life creates all sorts of enzymes, peptides, amino acids that are plant available. So instead of having to go through a process like your nitrogen or phosphorus that's put on, it has to go through a biological breakdown process these are actually plant available that they don't have to go through that. They're easily accessed by that. Uh, fungal hyphae, um, in our soils, they're very bacterial dominant. If you take them and look under a microscope, we don't have a lot of fungal component. A lot of that's from years of tillage. The actual tillage cuts those fungal strands up and the fungus can't survive in your soils because of the, the, the destruction or because of the, uh, because of the tillage. But um, once you go to more of a no-till system, if you can reduce some fertilizer, if you can reduce the amount of uh, chemicals that you put on, both of those can affect fungus, fungi too. But why fungal, fungal strands are important, you hear a lot about mycorrhizal fungi, for instance. Why these fungal strands are important is they can actually go into cracks and fissures into the soil that are so microscopic that the roots can't even penetrate it, that they can go into much tighter areas and they can actually harvest moisture during dry times. And they'll try to keep that plant alive for you because that plant's giving it a food source, giving it sugars. So basically that fungus is going to work for you too. Um, nothing more, again, another hot button topic right now with, with prices being like they are. 
what could you do with an extra 20 pounds of, of nutrients that you've cycled? You know, if you've got these tubers out there that are breaking down, you've got extra nutrients in the system, you know. So you can, you can uh, put, a, put a warm season mix in after your, after your, uh, after your wheat, and you can easily recover, um, just on the spray trips alone, you can recover the seed costs. But then when you start talking nutrient cycling, that's where you start talking, that's where you quote unquote make your money off of it if you're not doing grazing. For me, it happens to be grazing. I'm not advocating if you're not set up for grazing. If you don't have livestock on your operation, might not be the best fit. Maybe you have a kid or a grandkid or a cousin or something that wants to come back. It might be something you could partner with somebody on or a neighbor or somebody else that does want to have the livestock. I really feel like it's a good part for restoring really degraded systems because that livestock, it's a pretty easy way to walk pounds of beef off of the, off of the operation and turn it into cash. But it's also a, a, a way that you get a lot of biology from that gut of that ruminant animal. Um, you know, if you think about the rumen of an animal, it's there to digest a lot of cellulose and a lot of tough products. Um, that's the same way a lot of so soil life is there to digest that cellulose and a lot of that tough residues that are left over. So basically the stuff that comes out of the rumen and the manure and urine uh, or out of the manure, um, and then also the, ni the nitrogen and phosphorus you get from the, from the urine, you start getting some free nutrients there too. So um, again, when they, the actual act of grazing, they're actually stressing the plant a little bit. So I like to use high stock density just for the simple fact that they get on a piece of ground and then they get off rather quickly. You know, it's not something that you keep them out there for months on end and you have trails and, and you have no no uh, residue left. You can keep quite a bit of residue this way. Um, it's pretty easy with those with that poly wire, which poly wire is basically like a twine. Um, some of you might have used it. I know some of you are using it. Um, just it's just like a twine with a braided metal element in it. Real easy to put some step in posts and put that out there. It takes you like 45 minutes to do. Um, you know, I guess 35 minutes to do a half mile. It might take you a little bit longer. Maybe my legs are a little taller than longer than some people, but. Um, again, this is what sells it for me is I never like livestock because like I said, we dump them out in the spring and we pick them up in the fall. They'd be wild. They'd be breaking down fences. Now when we're around our livestock a lot more, I don't have a problem taking my kids out with me. They are very, very, I don't want to call them pets by any means, but they are very, very tame to the fact that working with them, one person can do what three people used to be able to do. So we're able to do something on our own if we need to separate off some calves or doctor a cow or something. We're able to do this singly without having to have my dad and brother on site or you know my wife or somebody else on site that we're able to do things uh, a lot easier now. Um, you know, again, it, it's not hard to, to move them. All you do is drop the fence. It's gonna be a little choppy and slow, I'm sure, but um, cattle are in a really good shape. Uh, if you can tell by this, when they're out on cover crops, they get a nice gleany sheen on their backs. Um, that's basically they're getting good nutrition and they're getting the right kind of oils and fats in them. And they just have a real nice sheen to them. It's a really good way if you've got like stalker cattle or you've got calves that you wanna put a little extra gain on. If you put them out on some cover crop for a couple weeks before you take them to a sale barn or before you sell them, they actually usually uh, do really well because they look really good. So. If you're doing this, don't try to get that one extra day. Um, again, dad's grazing versus my grazing. And when we went back to harvesting wheat, the next or the following crop after this, uh, there was like 20, 25 bushel difference between the bear versus where we left the residue. So don't try to take too much. Um, I guess for me, this is where it all goes down. Why do we leave all this residue? We could get more grazing days, no doubt. But for me, this forage is feeding the soil and that soil life is gonna feed the livestock for the future. So it's just an investment in next year. Again, if you wanna talk about chemical prices being like they are, if you can leave residue out there like that, outside of a, a, you know, some kind of season long program, really burn downs don't become nearly as much of a problem. There's been times where we've actually eliminated it. After grazing, we've eliminated a burn down practice of corn or beans in the spring when we planted because we've had enough residue that there just hasn't been enough weeds that justify a burn down that we just put our season long chemical as soon as we get done planting. You know, what about compaction? Compaction's more, a tie, uh, more of a management thing. If you leave them out there, they're gonna have loafing areas, they're gonna find compaction. Um, watering too, if you need to really have the water. We, we're just invested in a lot of trenching. 
a trencher and a lot of water line to put in a better watering system on our farm because if you do have one single tank spot they're going to really rough that area up around the tank but you know overall throughout the field it really didn't matter whether it was in fallow a graze treatment or an ungrazed treatment uh, that was k-state and colorado state studies that they pulled bulk density off my ground so basically we're not putting a lot of extra compaction in our soil but we're keeping a lot of residue because it works kind of like that snowshoe of keeping the cattle up out of there um, out of the out of the soil but um, if you leave that residue out there it really works for you especially in your wetter environment i'd say gra graze less leave more and those nutrients will be cycled into your next crop because those will break down. Uh, that's what strip grazing rye looks like. Nutrient placement, when you, when you subdivide this, your manure goes way up and your urine goes way up to where you start seeing the actual crop benefits from it. Um, again, cycling nutrients, if you just let them out over the whole thing, it'd take you 27 years to get a pile of manure per square yard which sounds crazy, but it, it actually, they, they did this study at the University of Missouri. Um, poor graduate students had to figure this out, I guess, but 24, uh, 24 paddocks. So that just means that you subdivide into 24. They don't always have to be out there at the same time, but you just do some moving. It'd take you two, and this is on our own farm. It, it took us one year to get something like that. You know, we did tighten them up and leave them for very, a lot of cows for a very short period. Um, again, leave a lot of soil armor and residue because, you know, the soil life, earthworms and soil life, they're going to take care of that, but they're going to cycle it. That's going to be your money in the bank for next year. You know, eat the best, you know, leave the rest. I don't care what they waste. Uh, you know, it sounds stupid and a lot of my neighbors laugh at me because we don't put up a lot of hay, but we're leaving that for the next year to plan into. And I'll tell you, when it comes to August and, you know, August, July, August, that late season when you don't catch the rain, our stuff lasts a lot longer because we've got, you know, that evaporation under control. And also late season weed control is not even usually an issue when you have residue like that. About the only thing I'd caution with is if you've got residue like that, you need to be really cognizant of where you put your nitrogen. You just don't lay your nitrogen on top. You know, you got to put the nitrogen, knife it in or, or put it down to where where it's into the soil because that'll tie up a lot of nitrogen. Um, 500 pounds of beef per acre in a grazing system, if you march 500 pounds of actual gain off, that's only 18 pounds of nitrogen, nine pounds of phosphorus, and, and one pound of potash. If you do four tons of hay of acre, I know that's probably pathetic down here for what your yields, but that's like our dry land yields in a, in a dry year could be. Probably more, you'd probably be more in the six or eight tons, I don't know, but that's more of an irrigated not in our area, but look at what you're removing you know, if you start talking, just even if you don't graze it, if you start talking, what could you do next year with 400 pounds? If you had nine tons of, of biomass, which on a warm season cover with, with rainfall after wheat, you could easily get that because I've had it in good years. I've had it get as tall as me, you know. Um, you can get 400 pounds of nitrogen. The next year, you could essentially have 400 pounds of nitrogen out there in the system that would cycle through. You know, you're talking real nutrition there for the next crop. You know, that's how people are saying they're getting by with raising 150 bushel corn on 80 units of nitrogen because they've got 400 units of nitrogen at some point in that system, you know, as it's breaking down. So, you know, again, if you're a cattleman, you know, we all know that we get dry and there's dry periods during the summer or slumps in our grasses and everything else. So if we can actually give our grasses time when we're out on some of these cover crops throughout the year, or we're incorporating this with our neighbor, maybe find a neighbor that doesn't have the animals that would let you run out livestock out there, you can give your, you know, your pastures a rest. This is what we look like. This was traditional buffalo grass and you know, weeds. That's basically what's left in August. After we started changing the management, we have fields or pastures that look like that in August that actually have some, and we start seeing weird things, vetches, and we have yellow sweet clovers and stuff like that coming back that we never used to have under set stalking. Um, in fact, dad and my brother get mad at me because we keep getting more cattle, but we have years where we don't utilize all of our pastures now. So we actually have stockpile, which is nice for when we get dry, like we're dry right now, and we're gonna be using those three pastures that we didn't get around to last year for this year, you know, to, for extra feed. But again, I'd be amiss to say that this is a process that happens overnight. Um, this was when we first started. You can see we did everything right. We had good cover. This was planted into a cover crop. We had good cover. We didn't have any moisture. We had a poor stand of corn that year. 
I think this was probably 13. 12, you were pretty dry down here, and this was 13, I believe, when we had this. But this is what it looked like when we first started off. This is the same fertility package now. Looks totally different, right? It's not because we've changed our fertility. It's because we have our soils functioning and actually cycling a lot more nutrition. Again, I can't harp again. I know you've heard leaf soil cover. That seems to be all he talks about. But most people do not invest in their soils like this. They want to take that one or two extra days of grazing, or they want to, you know, that intimidates them to plan into something like that. Really, there's not an intimidation factor. You might have to bump your speed down a little bit lower so that you're actually cutting. Because if you go too fast when you're planning in through stuff like that, the, the planter or the air drill has a tendency to rise up out of the ground. So you might have to go maybe five, five and a half miles an hour instead of six, six and a half. But you know, you can actually get into that. There's no problem. Just make sure you're down pressure. When you first start a field, get out of the tractor and make sure you're actually getting it into the ground, that you're not laying it between that litter layer and the ground. Because a lot of people just say, well, two inches is two inches. Well, if you've got two inches of litter on top that you're going through, you need to actually be almost like three and a half, four inches if you're going two inches in the ground. So, you know, you need to be cognizant of that. Um, again, we chose to change the way. I'm not here to preach at anybody because guess what? I'd, I used all of these implements. I spent, I wore that disc clean out. I mean, we've, I, I spent a lot of time replacing bearings and everything else. I plowed. Uh, we did a lot of plowing when I was young even, and we did ripping, we did chiseling, I did undercutting, I did everything. So I, I know what it's like. So I just chose to abandon that. And again, <laughs> Uh, if anybody wants something, we've got a lot of tillage equipment that just sits there. But um, this is what sells it. And hope, I don't know if it's going to show it or not, but it might, might not play. I don't know. We'll see if it actually plays. But this is basically a, a high input in no-till. We'll see if it plays. Maybe it's not going to play. Well, what the heck? It says it is. Oh, well, anyway, I'll go back. Let me see if I can go back. Anyway, what you're seeing there is all those little dots, that's bacteria. You see very little other life in that soil. Oh, great, now it's not gonna show that one. But anyway, um, hmm. anyway, all the wonders of technology. But uh, there, you see that's the no-till cover crops and grazing. It's actually a video that shows all this stuff swimming around and eating one another. But basically when you have things in there, you've got, these are nematodes. Uh, they're not a, necessarily a bad thing to have a nematode. There's a lot of uh, good nematodes not instead of parasitic nematodes. But there's nematodes, there's rod bacteria. There's actually some strands of fungi that you can't see that if we had it playing, you could see. But there's bacteria, but there's also other things in there and they're all consuming one another and that's what's feeding those plants. So, you know, with, a lot of different practices, you can build your soil biology. Um, for me, I just don't want to have to tell my kids someday that I don't want them on the farm or there's no place for them on the farm. If I can leave my farm in a better place, we don't have to farm half the county. We can actually farm what we've got and do a better job and actually be just as profitable. And I'm not stressed having to, you know, having to farm 6,000 or 10,000 acres to do it. So, you know, for me, it's leaving a good legacy of soil management. I've got my kids out there. I think my son, Thomas right there, he's probably already going to know way more than I ever know because he's already all pumped up and he's all mad that he couldn't come with me to stuff like this. But he loves learning about soil and digging and, and getting out there. So, you know, teaching them a love for the land is good too. Um, again, I did teach kindergarten. So uh, the Lorax, I'm not a big Dr. Seuss fan except for the fact that I thought that he wrote a really good book in this. It has a really strong uh, conservation message, and it says, unless someone like you cares an awful lot, nothing's going to get better. It's not. You know, we can do what's best on our little piece of the world, on our piece of our farm, but we really need the community aspect. We need everybody in this watershed. We need our neighbors. Um, groups like this is awesome for the simple fact it gives you time to fellowship and talk. We don't talk enough, you know, amongst farmers. We just don't. It's just a, a, we get busy and we don't share ideas. But anytime you can sit down over coffee or pizza or food, anytime you can sit down and just talk 
and maybe it's just you start with two neighbors and it's just a peer group. That's what I have in my area. It's not my neighbor, my direct neighbor. It's clear across. I'm on the eastern part of the county. I've got a friend on the western part of the county, but we talk all the time about what we're doing because we're trying to figure out how to make this work and what's better. And any time that we can talk, we shave off years off this process, you know, of figuring out how to do it. So um, again, whether you think you can or think you can't, you're usually right. 99.9% .9 of this is that mindset, that brain transplant. You just need to figure out how to make it work. It's not that it's going to be easy. There might be some road bumps, but you know, it's about figuring out how to work it and, and talking to one another and saying, well, I tried this and it didn't seem to work the best. And you know, maybe we need to go in a different direction. And then sometimes after you start down this journey long enough, you've been doing it for five or 10 years, some of the stuff that didn't work in year two starts working a little bit better. So you might have to go back and revisit some of the things that you gave up on and didn't work. But uh, again, um, education to me is key. Uh, again, I grew up in a household where I was taught to read and to be educated. Uh, any type of event like this you can get to, local ones are the best because you're with peers that are in your local area. But it's great to get out and see what people are doing across the region. Uh, no tell on the plains. Our newly formed Kansas Soil Health Alliance, we hope to have a lot more events, uh, hopefully with groups like the Cheney Lake Watershed, but with real Kansas farmers trying to help you guys just be better at what you're doing. Um, trying to get more people that are doing nothing. If you've got the neighbor that's no moldboard plying, we're here to try to find the guys that are, are, you know, haven't done anything and try to at least get them to try some new practices. So we're here to try to do that. The cool part about the Kansas Soil Health Alliance is on their website, they have a calendar of events that is statewide and actually region-wide. We even include Nebraska and Oklahoma events and stuff. So you can get on there. And if you're having an event, please let us know so it can be on the calendar because we want these events like today, widespread knowledge so that more people can attend them. Because there's been a lot of times I've found that something's happening in the next county over or you know, 20 miles from home, some conservation district's doing something and I don't know about it. And so that was always frustrating. So that's why we created this calendar. Get on there, please utilize it. You might find something that's 20, 40 miles away that, that could be educational that you could do in an afternoon and, and you know, pick up some knowledge there. Again, um, a little dry land environment, if you're a little further west, CCTA, the High Plains No-Till Association, they have an annual conference uh, in Burlington. Really good knowledge there. KansasSoilHealth.org is the website uh, from Facebook, Kansas Nebraska Soil Stewardship Group. There's a lot of people talking about soil health on there. I'm on Twitter. Twitter's kind of cool in the fact that it's short, but there's a lot of people on there doing some stuff just like what we're talking about today. So if I can help you in any way, please let me know. And uh, if not, I guess if there's any questions, we'll take a quick question and answer session. And if not, I'm done. So thank you very much, guys. Okay. Anybody have, throw them at me, and I don't know that I'll know enough. But between Bryce, myself, and and maybe even you guys have something that you want to talk about, or something that's a burning, burning question right now. You know, I, I, I guess I've talked with a few people in the room in the past. I know that. Something that is near and dear to my heart is I don't ever want to tell people to back off their fertility and to stop fertility because I think that that's the best way to have financial hardships and maybe even hard, uh, financial ruin. I would say be very smart about the way you apply. Uh, look at split applications, targeted applications. Maybe look at backing off a little bit of your in and replacing it with a micronutrient package. Um, there's a lot of things I think we can do that are just little, little things to, little nuances to fine tune our fertility that we could probably scale back in one area and not really mess with our fertilizer budget too much and put it into another part and probably have healthier plants and, and, and a little healthier soil. Um, probably the most thing that I've seen once we've been out digging around in other people's soils as well as my own is when we get really greedy and we try to put on that extra 10 or 15 units of nitrogen a lot of that salt loads just too much for the soil. And that's when you start taking that porosity. And um, a lot of the aggregation that's held apart with the porosity, that just implodes on you and you get start getting a hard surface crust or you start getting that top three or four inches that's just really kind of a hard layer. And then you get into a mellow layer below that, but you start getting a hard surface layer. And a lot of that's fertility related and, and you know problems with too much in one shot. So I guess that would be the other thing that I'd say with fertility being like it is, 
really ask the questions and get with, if you have an agronomist, really get with an agronomist and ask them the hard questions about, you know, where I can get by or what I can do or maybe how I can change things up a little bit. Yeah, Lyle. Do you soil test? Do you use the Haney test? And do you believe it? I believe the Haney test and the fact that I look at the Haney test as being above and beyond. I, I really believe that if you've got a large data set of your traditional soil tests, and you've got a long standing, maybe 10, 15, 20, 30 years, maybe some people 40 or 50 years, depending if grandpa or somebody did it too. But if you've got a large block of data from a traditional soil test, I'd say you keep pulling your traditional soil tests and you pull the Haney as a secondary soil test, that the Haney will show you what you're doing for the soil. If you got, you know, if you're starting to get more biology happening out there, maybe you've integrated some livestock, you've done something different in your management regime, pull a Haney because that's gonna give you the above and beyond. I'm not gonna say it's always gonna be there in dry times because as we dry out, a lot of this stuff is subaquatic. It needs moisture to survive. So as we dry out, a lot of things go dormant or they're not nearly as active or they might not be cycling as fast. So that's something to take into effect that the Haney test, if it says you've got 40 units of nitrogen, that's with moisture. So if we get into a really dry time in August, you're not gonna see all 40 units of that nitrogen come out in August because that's gonna be very limited by how much, if it's a wet August, it might. But if it's a dry August, you won't see it. So I think anybody that's using the Haney will tell you that, that in dry times, the Haney is just an above and beyond. So it gives you that security of not having to go back and put that extra 20 units in on because you know that the soil's producing an extra 20 units of in or 40 units of in. Um, something I might have been amiss in putting in is, you know, I think that there's a lot to the soil management. Uh, we've been doing a little bit with homemade biologicals. Uh, I've been doing a vermicast extract. I have uh, worms that I, all I do is just take the worm compost. And I just make it into a, a, excuse me, a slurry. I've just been treating my seed, but from what I've seen, I think I'm going to try in furrow next year. But in furrow where we did that, there was, 80, there was the equivalent of 80 pounds of nitrogen where we just did the covers and no-till, it was like 40 to 60 pounds of nitrogen equivalent. And right across the fence where they'd been long-term no-till, but they do like, a, or occasionally do like a vertical till or an inline rip and stuff, there's about 10 units of nitrogen in there. So the more that we push this system, the more that we can get that biology in the plant row and started, uh, that biology is going to give you a lot of that upside kick. So I'm not going to tell you to go out and spend a lot on, you know, any products because I'm not going to say that they work. But I say that there is something to this biology and where there's more biology in the rows, time and time again, dry time is the best way to see this because in dry times, where your biology is working around that root system, that row, you can take, stick a soil probe in maybe two or three feet where you can't get it into the soil between the row because it's, you know, that, that root system and the biology is actually doing something with the moisture and, and making more moisture available. So, you know, that's something to think about. But, you know, as far as really scaling back your fertility, I'd be very cognizant of making targeted applications and figuring out where you're getting your most bang for your buck. And maybe it's even, I'd be, I'd be totally in favor of you running eight rows or 16 rows or whatever you're set up for, or 30 or 40 feet, whatever your air drill is. Run some strips where you start scaling back, maybe 20, 30 units of in or 20, 30, or, or drop your FOSS down or, or don't run a starter band for some of it and see where you're getting the most bang for your buck. I mean, you, we need to be, nobody, no extension, I can't tell you, no microbiologist can tell you, only you can tell yourself what's working on your farm. And, and I'm not here to criticize or tell anybody how to do it. I just think that we need to be our own best, we're, it's in our own best interest to run some strip trials because nobody else is gonna, the fertilizer industry is not gonna tell you, yeah, you know, you should scale back an extra 40 units in. You know, um, I haven't really seen Extension doing a job of telling us where the good targets are either. So I think that we need to personally do that. And maybe it's we need to go with three or four neighbors and say, well, here's my fertility program. I'm trying this and, you know, run three or four different strips of different types of fertility treatments on the same field and see what's working and see, you know, uh, there's, there's no silver bullet, but I just think we need to do, the main thing is uh, 
on the fertilizer side, get a salt index and start looking at the salt index of the fertilizers you're using. Um, some are pretty caustic and pretty high salt load. And if you're putting a high salt load in one fell swoop and you're putting a lot on, you're probably doing something to your soil and you're damaging your microbiology where you might be able to put either a carbon source with it or put water with it and water it down and maybe go with two passes. Yeah, it's another pass, but it also gives you the availability in a really dry year. If you didn't go by with that second pass and you had 20 or 30 units of in for that second pass and you really, it's dry and you know the top end yield's not going to be, you can really scale that back and they'll allocate that to the next crop, the wheat crop or, or whatever afterwards. So, you know, I, I look at it, it gives you more flexibility with these split applications. It is more pain probably to do split applications, but you do get more soil health benefit, I think, from split applications too. So, and it gives you more flexibility too that you're not locked into saying, well, I put 160 units of in out there. I, I really want to grow 160 bushel corn. You know, if you put 100 and, you know, 105 bushel or 100 units of in out and you grow, you know, 110 bushels, you know, that, that other in can be allocated in the future. So um, again, I think it's just be able, you know, have a mindset of, of saying what the heck, I'm gonna try it, you know, and, you know, just, just play, see what happens, run some strips, so. Anything else? Another question, Michael. Yes. So you showed the picture of uh, the soil profile mm -hmm. um, comparing, you know, a conventional till to your, your no-till cover crop. How long had that soil profile been under that type of system? Oh, I'll go back. I'm just curious how long. Uh, like, um, I will show you that one that was real blocky. That was in the third year of, that one there was the third year of cover crop. That was about the sixth year of no-till, but about the third year of cover crop because our landlord was very resistant to using cover crops until they started getting mad because their other ground started looking better and yielding better than what they felt theirs was. And I told them, well, let me farm it the way I want to farm it then. And so finally they, they did you know, let us do that. But that's about three years in, and you can still see that's blocky. That's terrible soil structure as far as, that's years of, that was my dad's cousin. We took over this ground from my dad's cousin. He liked to chisel and he liked to disc. Those were about us two, and once in a while plow, but he really liked the chisel and the disc. So that's years of, of multiple disc pans. And I think you can kind of see where there's some undercut or some, some blade pans down in there. I mean, and that's probably, there might be an old plow pan right in there, but there's several blade pans and you can really see that part there was just beat to the devil. I mean, he'd make it into a talc is what he planted his wheat into every year. It was like talc. So that kind of gives you an idea. But um, this here, this was probably about uh, four or five years of intensive cover crops. And what I mean by intensive, was it was more for grazing than it was for grain. Uh, we'd do like a, a cool season one, like an oats pea mix, uh, graze that off in probably like May-ish, uh, plant a warm season mix in June, July, somewhere in there, um, depending on when we got the moisture. Uh, graze that off probably August, August-ish, you know, when it was still in season. Try to plant either, if we had moisture, we'd plant like a, a wheat or a rye or something. Sometimes we graze it off in the spring. Sometimes we take it, you know, to grain. And then we just keep hitting it with a lot of the grazing side of things. So uh, the grazing does push things a little bit faster just for the simple fact it stresses that plant and it leaks more. Um, there's been some people trying to do, you know, applications where they've mowed or kind of try to make synthetic grazing, you know, to stress the plant enough that it'll come back and do some of the stuff. I don't know that they've had quite the results that you do with the grazing. It's just something about the, you know, I think it's the, the biology and everything else out. But, but again, um, this here, uh, this is a few years back. If we took that today, you can see a lot more down in the profile. It's, it's pretty telling. If you ever get time, like fall would be a good time after harvest. If your ground's not froze up solid by then, if you have time, go out with a loader bucket or, you know, if you've got a neighbor that's got a backhoe or something, just dig a little bit of a pit. And if, even if you don't have that, just go out with a shovel and start digging down the first couple feet or a post hole digger, and you'll start seeing these layers and it'll be pretty telling about how you're managing your soils. Really, we get so focused on the above, you know, that's where our yield is, that's where our crop's growing, but we need to be way more focused down here 
because this stuff down here where our moisture is, our moisture profiles are, all of this stuff grows all the stuff above, so all your profit starts with down here in the soil. So the more we focus on this and where the moisture is, and, and if you don't know what you're looking for, there are great people out there. There's a lot of good NRCS people. Howard knows a lot of people through NRCS and through grazing and through, you know, through a lot of different sources. He can find somebody to come walk you through it. And once they've showed you in a pit, you start seeing these layers, knowing what to look for, and then you don't have to have the people back out. You can kind of know what's going on. But that's just kind of, you know, that, that's the thing that drives me is we actually physically see some really, really poor soils because like I said, when I came up, I wasn't, we didn't have enough ground for me to farm. So we've taken on every crap piece of ground that every other farmer didn't want, or you know, that was the poorest soil that there was. So we've had a lot of soil building experience, so to speak, but we're seeing a, we're seeing a, a definite change, you know, um, and profitability wise, you know, it took, like I said, my mom and dad said that they die in debt and they, we'd inherit their debt. Um, you know, we have got everything free and clear right now. Uh, it's made a huge difference in the profit potential of our farm. You know, just being able to cut some of those inputs out or more systematic with our inputs, uh, integrating the livestock and running almost twice as many cattle as we used to run, um, you know, on the same amount of ground. It's, it's been huge, you know. I mean, there's, there's a lot of things. If, if you take care of the soil, it will take care of you. And I'm not here to, I could care less if you know my name or know who I am even. It's, it's more about, you know, the resource. I want you to take care of your soil because I've seen what it does for me and for, you know, hopefully for my future generations that want to farm. So anyway, that's all. Sure, that shows me, I guess, you know, towards the beginning of your presentation, you said that cover crops use moisture. And of course, that's a big management concern where you're at in northwestern Kansas. But um, by growing cover crops, you uh, improved your soil. Yep, you could just look at it. I look at cover crops as being not a one year one game. There's gonna be a farmer that's conventional till or there's gonna be a farmer that's just strictly no till that they might have a higher yield in year one. It's about long-term profitability. It's about overall profitability, two, three, four, five years down the road. I mean, when we can say that we've eliminated three or four shuttles of chemical, with chemical being the price it is now, what's that gonna be in the next, you know, if we continue to have I mean, I don't foresee things really changing a lot from our current scenario. We're gonna have a lot of vol volatility in fertilizer markets and chemical markets. And if we can get to the point where we can say, I don't need three extra shuttles of chemical this year, that's gonna make us happier. It's gonna make the banker way happier. You know, I, and that's something that you, know, you think the banker, banker would be less happy the further we've gone down this path because, but he's happier in the fact that he knows that we're a good credit risk that you know, if we say we're gonna do something he knows that we're gonna do it and that we're gonna be good for it too versus, you know, it, it's, it's a lot better to feel, feeling to go into the bank in a good way than it is to be like, oh, you know, I gotta refinance this or I gotta look at this. So um, to me, the profit potential has come around with good soil management. I mean, they go hand in hand. Good soil management, good healthy soils will help you produce crops, you know, in, in a way that you probably won't have to have quite as many inputs, so. Yes. That second or third crop, are you able to beat that down the cow and not plant into it without chemical filling it? Uh, yes and no. Um, one thing I will caution you against, if you're ever planting into cereal rye, please, please terminate it because cereal rye just, and, and some, some people have had some things, oats are another thing that some people have had some issues with, with like planting sorghum and stuff into it afterwards. Um, rye and some of the grasses, the, the cool season grasses, can have some retarding effects on like a, a warm season or if you planted like a milo or a sedan or something like that into it, any of the warm season grasses. There seems to be some kind of lag if you don't have it killed for 10 days to two weeks or something. I'm so. cow peas, the rye is termed. Mm -hmm. I'm cow peas in a mix there. The cow peas yep. did really well, nothing else did very good. If you probably would have crimped that maybe uh, I think it could be, and it could still be, you know, that some of those studies have showed that there's stuff, 
60, 80, 100 days out that are either released or there's nitrogen. There's two camps on like rye and some of these cereals. One is that it's tying up all the nitrogen, a lot of the available nutrients. So it's basically starved the whole system. So those plants can't get a healthy start because they've got nothing going. The other camp says that there's actually an allopathic chemical effect that they produce. That's actually some chemicals or toxins that are still in the plant that are released over time, you know, 60, 80, 100 days out. That's why, you know, they've had a lot of luck with cereal rye ahead of soybeans because the, the cereal rye holds back that. But we found that in mixed grass crops, when we start doing the grasses, some of those grasses are really suppressed by a lot of those winter cereals. Don't, I, and I can't tell you, we, we've done a lot of talking to a lot of people way smarter than us in the scientific world, and there's still that two camp, whether it's residual nitrogen tie or nutrient tie up, or whether it's actually, you know. So the main thing I'd say with cereal rye is be very cognizant and maybe even hesitant if you're gonna put it with another grass afterwards, maybe look into more like, you know, um, uh, something that's gonna terminate easier. I haven't had personally as much uh, problem with triticale when I planted triticale in the fall. Um, in, in the fall, I've got a crabgrass, it's a crabgrass rye, so mm -hmm. in the fall, uh, if, if I don't till it, the rye doesn't grow. Yep. Planting and, planting and tilling rye is the same thing. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. 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 The 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 crab the crabgrass would be a huge nitrogen tie up. So. Yeah. Yeah, and it also suppresses. So basically, in that kind of scenario, if you're doing something with like a, a rye or crabgrass, that's the time where you don't leave residue like what I was talking about. That's where you really have got to nail it down. I mean, you've got to almost overgraze and really, really hit it hard. Never feel sorry for a lot. Yeah, yeah, don't, don't, don't feel sorry for a lot. And I think that uh, we don't have crabgrass but from talking with some of my friends further south that do. It's the same kind of animal that you don't feel sorry for it, that you really hit it hard. And again, probably what you're doing is even if you hit it hard, you're sloughing off roofs, roots and you're actually putting more carbon into the system. But yeah, um, so the, the hardest part for me and I think Bryce will say too, maybe this is our Western Kansas drier environment. We have a hard time with a lot of our legumes producing enough nitrogen credit to always be there because we're in Kansas. Some years when we get adequate moisture, we'll say, oh, we really see that. And a lot of years of just normal rainfall or below rainfall, we'll be like, where in the heck's any credit whatsoever, you know? So I think that's the, that's the, the thing about, I wouldn't ever get too excited about, you know, a lot of those, I think it's good for the diversity standpoint, but I'm not 100% sure that we're getting a super amount of the nitrogen credits from that legume because there's just so many factors involved with, with our soils wet and dry and, and that kind of thing. So that's the only thing that I'd say is that be very cognizant. You know, it's pretty attractive now to plant some legumes to try to get some fertilizer, but also be cognizant, um, you know, have something in your back pocket that you might have to put some nitrogen on still because there's, there's gonna be a, there's gonna be that X factor of how much nitrogen your legumes actually grew. So just don't, don't go out thinking that just because you saw in Ohio, somebody had 160 pounds nitrogen credit off a hairy vetch crop, they have a lot of, ni the, the thing they don't tell you is that that 160 pounds is available in the next year because of their 45, 50 inch rainfall, that, that all that microbiology is cycling that whole biomass. So they can take stuff that we can roll stuff up taller than me and we can roll it down and they're, it's bare ground by midsummer. I mean, they, they cycle that fast. So water drives the whole system. So you guys in this room can do 10 times more than Bryce and I can. The, 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 every inch or two inches that we drop, you know, as we go further across the state, you know, we just can't push, the system's not gonna be as fast. You guys can push the system a little bit harder and it's gonna be faster to recover too because it is a water-based system. But you just gotta always have that in your head too that you probably, you won't be able to do what somebody in Kansas City or Missouri is gonna be doing because they get just, you know, another five, 10 inches of rainfall, you know, over that way. So, you know, just, just be cognizant. I'd always encourage you to find friends further west and take things east, then find people east and try to move them west because it's way harder to move ideas from a higher rainfall environment into our dryer. I'm not saying it can't be done, 
but it's, it's harder to talk to those people and to understand it because they have such a different, you know, a different environment. So that's the thing that you gotta say. You can take a lot of ideas, but then you've gotta apply them how it works on your farm. You can't just, there's no plug and play. That's, that's the whole part. This is what makes this not attractive is because you have to think and you have to, it, it really is a, a harder thing that it, a lot of times there's more questions than answers that once you got something, you've got to go with it, but you've got to do some experimentation. So that's where it comes in, peer groups help, so. Thank you, Mark. Yep. You off. No, you're fine.